Nothing's better than fresh fruit from the garden. I just can't say that enough. This particular plant will actually shoot up additional leaf tissue. The program was to create food for the public. They are public orchards. It's a lot of work, but it really is worth it when you see all these blooms and it's gorgeous. Hello and welcome to Great Gardening. I'm Dennis Lamkin, your host this evening. Uh, we have our garden experts with us tonight. They are horticulturist and educator Bob Olin and gardener, garden professional Deb Burns Erickson. As always, we want to hear from gardeners across the region who have questions for our experts on all things gardening. Volunteers from the St. Louis County Master Gardeners Program are here to answer phones. Call locally at 218-788-2844, uh, toll free 877-307-8762 or you can email questions to us at ask at wdse.org. How about the current conditions? Oh, some we're making sunshine. Progress. Come on, some sunshine, Bob. <laughs> it was warm today. It was sunny. <laughs> and down near the lake, we melted a lot of nice. snow yeah, up nice. over the hill where you and I both reside. Yeah, uh, we got plenty of snow yet, yeah. but it's, it's leaving us quickly. There we yeah, go. There, it's yeah. it's we're good. making it's progress. Right. That's a yeah. time lapse. Next week, it's all gone, and we're going to have something green in there, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, the theme for tonight's episode is greenhouses. Uh, we'll have more information coming up, but first we visited uh, with Eddie Gilmore of Duluth. He's a micro green grower who runs Instagram account at Tiny Farm Duluth, and he gave us a tour of his space. I'm Eddie Gilmore. We are in Duluth in the Lakeside neighborhood. We're in a grow room in my home. It's an addition that we built for the micro been doing microgreens for five years, farming for six. I started out in people's backyards growing traditional crops, uh, radish, carrots, lettuce, you know, things like that. Gradually I just, yeah, I just migrated into microgreens and uh, filled that niche in the, in the city. Microgreens are just baby plants. So the difference between microgreens and sprouts is it's just another stage. Microgreens are grown in soil, and when I harvest them, we'll take a very, very sharp knife and cut them, obviously above the soil line, um, and then that's what you're eating. So th these will be ready at uh, day eight. I put these pea seed in the water and soak it for eight hours plus, and then I'm just throwing it on top of a very basic soil mix. I stack them, put two 17-pound bricks on top of it, and then I walk away. And three days later, like magic, it's, it's there. Like it'll be like 80 degrees in here and then heat is like the main factor in how fast things grow. It's so simple though, honest to goodness. So like this is a 10 by 20 tray, 1020 it's called. You know, like I would say a, a personal use person would buy a 10 by 10. These are pea shoots. These are pea shoots right when they come out of germination. So three days after I plant them, they'll look like that. These are radishes just immediately coming out of germination as well. This is enough uh, PC for three, three trays. Then I like to give it a little rinse. And then I'll just dump it into this thing and we'll go outside and we'll plant. I like to use good warm water since we're outside. All right, so nice big movements. These trays have slots in them, so the water will drain. Obviously, you need a tray that's gonna drain like this, these holes. And then I'm gonna nest them into this one with no holes. I'm doing one tray of radish and three trays of peas. So relatively even, you don't have to overthink it. Now here's the pea seed. I'm just gonna dump it on the dirt. If you're planting peas outside, definitely soak them. I soak them for eight hours. But once they're soaked, man, they just want to grow. All right, time to water it in. Nice and big. We're sweeping back and forth, back and forth, like a windshield wiper. Now I'm just going to stack them. And now I'm going to put these up top and put a couple bricks on them. Once again, in three days, they'll look exactly like, like those do there. This is week after week after week, very dependable, and people love it. So like with anything, you just start doing it. You start growing and you, you, you just adapt. 
Very interesting. Uh, let's get to a few questions. We have a uh, first question from Terry um, uh, from Grand Rapids. What's the best time to uh, split uh, hostas and lilies? You could take a crack at that. Well, <laughs> I, I would wait till they're emerging a little bit and um, then I would start to, uh, well, rake back if you have any, you know, debris above it and see how big it is, see how much you should really split apart from it. Mm -hmm. I like to take um, I don't really like to just go into quarters, but mm -hmm. I like to take smaller wedges out just mm -hmm. so that I don't, you can have more loss if mm -hmm. you take a big cut out of something mm -hmm. than if you just take out some. Mm -hmm. And then you just, you can either pot it up or start moving them around. And the nice thing is that those are a couple of plants that uh, do transplant readily and uh, the time of year is easier in the spring and early fall when temperature a little cooler, but they transplant just about any time. Right, less stress on them. Less you can stress. do them in the middle of the summer, but you better water them. Yeah. Got plenty of water. Yep. 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 Also, she says her crab apple trees seem to be dying. The branches are starting to die. What can she do about it? Oh, that's when we want to take a little look at that, wouldn't we? Exactly what might be causing that. Um, this time of year, we see a lot of sun scald, actually, that, that, that uh, damages the tree, and uh, trees have a certain longevity as well, so we'd like to know perhaps how old that tree is. But uh, if it's a younger tree and there's a lot of damage to the bark, uh, I think either painting with a latex paint, not an oil paint, uh, paint that south side or wrap the tree to make sure that you're not getting any of that damage from the warm sun reflecting off the snow this time of year. So if that could be a portion of the problem. Uh, they're also vulnerable to scab and some other fungal diseases, so we'd have to take a little closer look, really, Dennis. Okay. Mary from Duluth uh, kept her geraniums in the sunroom uh, all winter. When can she start bringing them outside? Outside? Mm. Yeah. Ooh, well, we want to be above, you know, freezing. Yeah, not tonight. N no, not tonight. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of times I, I like to give them a nice fresh cut back. Um, to start with so that you don't get long leggy mm -hmm. people let these geraniums get so long and just so leggy and I know you're delaying the bloom but if you give them a nice cut back you can safely go halfway back without any issue and then they'll start to break below nicer a more compact a more appealing geranium so I would start now and, and start cutting it back shaping it and then you're gonna have to watch nighttime temperatures mm -hmm. just like anything else sure. You bring them out and bring them back in? Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. You know, one thing that I suggest to people, because you're right when they cut them back, and you, as soon as the days are getting longer, if you've got a warm environment, you can cut those back. It delays the bloom. So I like to suggest that people buy some new material every year mm -hmm. for the early bloom in the right. season, and then those that you cut back will be blooming just a little bit later on, and you're constantly renewing uh, that vegetative material mm -hmm. that way. Yeah. Great. Uh, Carol, uh, where can I buy an English rose, and is, is it a good border shrub? Oh, oh like are we talking Austin, David? I mean, is that what well, she's thinking? I'm not sure. I don't know what an English an rose is. An old-fashioned English rose, uh, I really think, and I, I think in what she's talking about, that it's not going to be very hardy. Mm -mm. You know, we uh, unless you're willing to protect them, uh, I'm sure there, there are places where you could access, and there are a lot of rose growers uh, on the West Coast in Oregon that where you can get that type of older material. But, uh, you know, we're partial really to some of the shrub roses, and in particular some of the Canadian shrub roses yes, the developed up mm -hmm. in Morden at their research mm -hmm. station there because they're so very hardy here. Put them in the ground once, don't have to worry about covering them. Mm -hmm. uh, there may be a little bit of damage to the upper portion, and you just trim them up every year, and uh, they can be very, very magnificent. Yep, every so spring, yep. A little partial to Winnipeg those. Parks, too. That's a nice border rose. Yeah, that'd be it's very really nice. nice. Um, let's see, we have one here that just uh, came in. Betty from Duluth, I have softened water. Would this cause the uh, plant leaves to turn brown? We it can't, yeah. Well, could, but salt. it's not, it's, well, it's, it's uh, there's that sodium salt exchange. There's not actually uh, that type of salt, but it's actually the fluoride in the water that can cause the tips to go brown. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily the fact that it's been softened, but softened in quotes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I think, and I've advised people for your house plants, particularly on some of those thin leaf materials, mm -hmm. the spider plant, chlorophytum, is one that's very vulnerable to fluoride. Mm -hmm. uh, take the water you're gonna use for watering and let it sit for 24 hours. It all evaporates, the fluoride evaporates out of the water and you're, she's not gonna have a problem with it. Mm -hmm. And she might want to prune it up a little bit. Mm. This is the time of year as the days are getting longer that you can cut those back 
if there is some damage that won't mm -hmm. be recoverable. But uh, prune it up a little bit and then water with something without the fluoride in it. And, and sometimes she'll be fine. on those tips, if you just cut up to where the brown starts, don't mm -hmm. you don't always have to cut into the green material because then it's going to brown, it's going to heal itself. So sure. you can just go to okay. the edge of it so you're not cutting into the green material. Uh, Diane from Duluth, what house plants are there that are not toxic to her cat or kittens? So we just said spider plants yep. and spider plants and peperomia. We talked about that last week. Um, Big family of plants there. Yeah, and lots of and easy to care for. Um, what else is there? You know, when people ask often about uh, house plants that might be toxic, I always advise anything that, bear, that has a berry of any type. That's mm -hmm. number one. You want to be extremely mm -hmm. careful of and that can be attractive, particularly younger kids as well as potentially cats. Anything maybe with a, a milky sap as oh, well. Oh, for sure. You know, the uh, euphorbs and mm -hmm, so forth. Mm -hmm. You want to be uh, careful of those. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and just as a general rule, you don't want to want your animals or anyone eating the vegetative portion of any house plant, really. Right. Hmm. Uh, what are the best grapes to grow in Duluth? Okay. Well, we're partial to Valiant, I think, mm -hmm. is one of the real mm -hmm. great ones out yep. there. and. Uh, Beta, beta, beta yeah. which is uh, uh, an introduction uh, actually that has some of our wild grape in it. So we really got uh, three big Flavor. ones that I recommend. We got uh, Beta, K Valiant, and Bluebell. And what about Keg? Keg Keg as well, yeah. yeah. And they were introductions from the University of Wisconsin, the University of South Dakota, or South Dakota U, and then the University of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So you can, uh, you can support all three of these great egg, land, egg uh, uh, institutions. Uh, by buying one of three, Bluebell, Valiant, and uh, Beta. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Are there any new plants uh, you'd recommend for this spring? It doesn't say, but I assume probably talking about flowers. Flowers, Flying annuals. Plants. There, we have one on the desk, which is a new um, headliner strawberry surprise. It's a, um, it's got a spot to it. It's a petunia, and um, it's got really nice growth habit on it. Um, that is something new this year. Um, that's very attractive, and you get mm -hmm. some of there as yeah, well. Yeah, right. Yep, yeah. and another one here, and that's different. Um, and there's a new verbenas, really nice verbenas. Mm -hmm. um, Proven Winners did a nice verbena, a new heliotrope um, from Proven Winners also. That's um, got a completely different growth habit and a, a little bit lighter color to the heliotrope, and um, it doesn't. It can take the heat and the humidity better. Um, but there's across the board all kinds of different things that are available this year. And if people want pollinator friendly, I know you're going to talk about that on mm -hmm. Saturday. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you just generally recommend? Like an open faced daisy, um, you know, the gerberas are good and they want pollen and they want nectar. Pollen is their protein and mm -hmm. nectar is their carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. So um, an open faced flower a lot of times will give them both things and something that can support their weight when they're on it too. That's helpful. Okay. Uh, Jean from Esco, where can I get my soil tested? Oh, there we go. Um, either University of Minnesota, University of Wisconsin. We always recommend a certified lab. There are also our private labs out there. Uh, just Google soil test lab, University of Minnesota soil test lab, University of Wisconsin. Both are certified labs, which means the results are accurate. They'll stand up in court. So uh, get one, at least one good soil test so you know where you, that you've mm -hmm. got reliable information to start from. Stay away from Great. some of the home kits. Great. Deb, you wanted to share a few tricks of the trade for greenhouses? Sure, for, yeah, for greenhouse growing. And these are just my opinion and this is how we do it. Um, I believe in orienting the greenhouse north and south. So when it's warm, you can um, get a lot of wind to go through from the south. Because when it's warm, you're gonna have a south wind sometimes and that'll help uh, ventilate and get the heat out. It's also uh, less of a north wall to heat and to keep warm. So it's easier to warm up. Um, number two, a knee wall to the north wall and um, insulate and berm up as much of the walls as you can because that earth is going to give you heat um, in the spring a little bit sooner and hold heat a little bit longer in the fall. You can collect rainwater from a heat si for a heat sink for the plants instead of well and use it to water instead of well water or city water, which is metered and, and well water can be hard water. Um, number four, wireless thermometers, um, multiple ones, you can use them in different um, areas, but the middle of the greenhouse is the warmest. The 
outside walls are the coolest, so you'd want to watch where the cool spots are if you're really worried about your um, whatever you're growing in there. And also, um, but you can grow the cooler crops out towards the walls. Um, number five, heat rises. It could be 30 degrees warmer six feet off the ground than mm -hmm. it is down on the ground. So you've got to keep that in mind in what your placement is. Put your heat levers up high and the things that can tolerate colder down on the ground. And then um, number six, fans, 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 fans. <laughs> I love fans um, because they move the cold off the ground. They move the heat down to the floor. They eliminate cold zones and hot zones. They just equalize everything so well. And then it's a lot better growing conditions for plants. Um, number seven, use frost cloth to cover tender seedlings and to heat with, um, you can use like a chicken heater, you can use any little heater if you have your seedlings covered with frost cloth and the heat can rise up from underneath them. Um, and then I would always have two sources of heat in case one fails because mm -hmm. that's the worst thing to happen. Mm -hmm. um, number eight, windows and doors for ventilation, also shade cloth for the summer to cool it. Uh, number nine, extend your growing season by six weeks in the beginning of spring and in the fall. Um, and you can do later plantings and you can harvest a lot more things. And you are becoming more sustainable, more self-reliant, uh, lower cost for food. And number 10, this is for my father. Uh, <laughs> don't plant too much. Um, just because you can grow it doesn't mean that you should grow it. You still have to find room to plant it and take care of it and maintain it. So don't don't overdo it, Bob. Thanks, Deb. <laughs> Thanks, Deb. You know your father's watching, right? I know he is. Uh, Bruce from Two Harbors uh, bought a bag of pink lady apples, and the seeds are sprouting. Can he plant these? Well, he sure can, but he's not necessarily going to get a pink lady. As a matter of fact, we can guarantee he's not going to get a pink lady. Uh, once they come up with a variety, and that's one that really isn't available to the general public yet. But uh, once they come up with a good variety, they take vegetative cuttings because they want to keep the genetics pure. And any time you're mixing pollen, uh, you're going to have a seed that uh, carries the characteristics of both parents. Consequently, it's not going to necessarily have the characteristics you're looking for. So you can plant them. They're right. kind of fun. And probably not the hardiest rootstock is going to come on Not the hardiest rootstock either, either but uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Betty uh, from Duluth, my climbing hydrangea has been nibbled by rabbits. Hmm. Will it come back? How much nibbling? Doesn't say. Does it go all the way around? We're in trouble. Yeah. Right? If it's going all the way around. If um, it's a main stem and grilled all the way around, it's time to prune at ground level. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yet the funny thing is, this is true of uh, tender bark trees, too. You just mm -hmm. put in a new apple tree or maple or something, and if it gets girdled all the way around, and with the snow level, snow cover, we'll see it maybe underneath that bowls, or we'll see it up on the snow line. Uh, if it's girdled all the way down and it's a deep cut, the tree will butt out and people think there's no damage, but uh, it's not going to be able to, re yeah, it's stored energy, mm -hmm. it's not going to be able to replenish that. So if it's that kind of extensive damage, uh, prune at ground level and plant a new one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rick wants to know when's the best time to prune an apple tree. Ooh. Ooh, do you have time yet? No. Mm. No, I think we could. Do you think so? Yeah, it's been cold enough. It depends. Yeah, the, it's oh. such a late spring. I'd yeah. get out there tonight. Right, Wait tonight, till the show's yes. done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, we call it a dormant prune. There's good reasons to do it right now. It's yeah. it's very stimulative, and you want to stimulate new growth this time of year. If you're pruning during the main season, first off, you open up a lot of wounds with the potential for mm -hmm. danger there, damage there mm -hmm. from pathogens in the environment. And then also it has a, a tendency to reduce the growth. So we want to be pruning right wow. now. Right. Okay. Let's see, we can go to a quick one. Uh, why doesn't my violet bloom? It looks healthy, but doesn't, uh, doesn't seem to want to bloom. No buds, no nothing. Well, does she have buds at all? No buds? No buds. Yeah, no buds. No, nothing. Well, mm. a lot of reasons. First, you, you've got to have that vigor. Mm -hmm. So there's got to be plenty of sun. Yeah. And then um, you've got to watch your, your nutrient management. Sometimes people don't think they're fertilizing, but they're fertilizing all the ground around that shrub. Mm -hmm. So it's getting a lot of nitrogen. So oftentimes we can have ni too much nitrogen at the expense of bud formation. The other thing is sometimes it takes a while for them to come from the juvenile stage to the adult stage, and at what point they're going to set those uh, reproduction reproductive flowers. So sometimes it's just a question of pain, patience, but it can be a number of factors. Mm -hmm. But stay with it. They generally will bloom for you. Okay, uh, Bob, you wanted to uh, talk about unheated greenhouse structures. Well, it's kind of interesting. Uh, 
with the current price of energy, whether it be propane or whether it be fuel oil, uh, people might consider an unheated option. And uh, we do a lot of production now in these called high tunnels uh, where we don't really have a supplemental heat source. So we're going to be starting later. This is something you're not going to start in January, obviously. And you might have to supplement with some kind of an electric heater, but uh, they're, they're really uh, very useful for, for production. And it, obviously, you don't have so much of a heat issue uh, lack of heat, you've got surplus heat. So when you mention you're a big fan of fans, mm -hmm. right? I am a fan uh, of fans. You have to be extremely careful about anything that's unheated, anything that's covered with poly, they can get warm very fast, even if it's uh, even below freezing outside. So you have to be a little careful. And we've got some other options. And here's the uh, options that are a little more practical for the homeowner. And these are a couple examples of uh, ones we've grown in this area or produced in this area. And uh, they're smaller. Uh, I think you get uh, with a smaller uh, facility like that, they're a little bit easier to manage, but they also can heat very quickly. So the less airspace you've got, the more you have to pay attention to that fan, getting the vents open, or in the case of the smaller one down below, which I put together, very simple uh, type of a device, but vents on the end and you can roll up the side. So you've got to be very careful on a warm day to make sure you get the heat out of there. Great. Bob, you wanted to mention an event coming up for the community calendar? Yeah, we've talked about it. Uh, we're going to be down at the depot uh, this Saturday. That's just a day and a half away, and Deb's going to join us. We happen to have, we put together a resource book every year, and uh, Deb's contributed some original mm -hmm. material. This is, I don't know, maybe 75 or 80, 80 pages of original material, all of fruit variety lists, the vegetable variety lists. We're, we're talking about the concept of an integrated landscape where you're going to have pollinator, pollinating annuals, mm -hmm. perennials, trees and shrubs, and they're going to be pollinating your vegetables. So we're going to talk about tomatoes and uh, ripe peppers as well as small fruit. And then we're going to integrate it all with a bee-friendly lawn. So mm -hmm. with ecological practices. Good day. There's still a little bit of room, although we're nearly full. And uh, if you're interested, there's the phone number, 733-2870. Or just uh, Google St. Louis County Extension. And uh, there's some information about the program there. Make sure you call tomorrow on Friday uh, because there may not be room uh, by the time we get to Saturday morning. Okay. Let's wrap things up with a few more questions. Uh, Scott from Duluth, uh, what does Eddie do with the microgreens? Oh, well, Eddie was uh, a grower down at the uh, farmer's market, so mm -hmm. he was marketing them there, and he may be marketing other places now, but he's found an outlet for them. Uh, it'd be a little difficult to consume all those yourself. Talk about the salad. <laughs> That's plenty of salad. And I'm going to mm -hmm. guess that he does it to restaurants and also to um, Whole Foods. I know there is a market for it, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that he has some other outlets as well. Uh, can you plant the uh, sunflower seeds that are sold as bird food? Mary wanted to know from Duluth. Well, okay, I have, so we right. flooded one year and we had sunflowers in our garage and they went everywhere and we had the most, and it was the 4th of July when we flooded and we had beautiful sunflowers all over in our fields. So you can. They will. Whether or not and, you're going to get the sunflowers because of the date and how long they are and how long it takes to get to maturity. You definitely can. Uh, and we're going to give people three different types of sunflowers. You want to look for varieties that have pollen. Some of the new ornamentals are pollen free, mm -hmm. and that doesn't help the pollinators. But uh, an oil seed, uh, the honeybees don't particularly like that, uh, those flowers, but the other pollinating insects do. So uh, if you want something that does everything, stick with the old fashioned varieties like the giant mammoth and uh, the, even the Russian mammoth. They're great varieties that. Uh, the bees love, and they're beautiful in your backyard as well. But they'll germinate if you if you <laughs> want to use that for uh, bird, the yep. bird seed or uh, even some of the oil seed varieties. Okay. Uh, Lee wants to know, how do you transplant a Christmas cactus? Oh, well, I mean, I'm not exactly sure. Okay, so a Christmas cactus is relatively easy to transplant. It's just dependent on, you know, how root-bound it is, if you really want to transplant it, and why do you really want to transplant it. Because a lot of times they're a little on the slow growing. They don't have mm -hmm. a big root um, system. And so, it, I mean, myself, I would just take it just like anything else, flip it out of its container, and have another container ready to go into, and not more than an inch around now uh, and some nice clean light soil um, cacti soil would be the best soil and um, just set it back in fill in the void and water it really well when you do transplant it well said they like to be root bound so don't over transplant yeah. those um, Marianne from South Range uh, 
tulips are starting to poke through a little bit. Should she uncover them now? Yeah, you know, if I would, but you'd be careful. Pull the straw back. They can be deformed if you have a real heavy straw labor. Pull it back, but be prepared if it really gets cold to cover them back up again. Okay. Uh, when should I, when should uh, Kathy from Carleton prune her roses? Well, again, she could do that right now. Mm -hmm. be a good idea. Mm -hmm. Prune back to the, the portion that's pliable and green. Take mm -hmm. off the dead uh, material mm -hmm. at this point. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you all for tuning in to Great Gardening. If you want more, you can follow us on Instagram at Great Gardening WDSE. Subscribe to us on YouTube.com uh, slash Great Gardening. And like us on Facebook at WDSE WRPT. If you missed any part of the show this evening, It'll be posted on our YouTube channel and our PBS video app tomorrow. Thanks, Deb. Thanks, Bob. It was a great show tonight. Thank I enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. We'll be back next week. From all of us here, thank you and enjoy the garden. <laughs>